morning, Lighthouse Church. It's beautiful morning after the storm. Yeah. So uh, if you're new to us here at Lighthouse Church, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome. If you uh, have any questions about, more questions about who we are uh, and, and where we see ourselves in the body of Christ, there are, there are folks out in the lobby after the service. You can get with them, find an elder, um, uh, find one of them, and, and they can give you more information about, about us. Um, I want to talk before we get started, uh, before we spend the next uh, 20 minutes in, in, in worship, uh, about victory. Victory. Uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines victory as the overcoming of an enemy or an antagonist. Now, the Bible kind of fleshes that out a little bit. We have like a worldly view where victory might be winning a game. It might be uh, winning an argument might be the victory of being right. Anybody uh, have that one going? I just did it a little while ago. Um, victory of being first in line. Uh, Maria the other day said the victory of finding your, getting the best parking spot, you know, uh, uh, the victory of job promotion. Those are worldly victories. Uh, in the Bible, um, God and Jesus speak of a godly view of, of victory where uh, the enemy is sin and death where um, uh, the antagonist is Satan. Uh, Paul says it best, I think, in Corinthians. He says, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who lived and died as a sacrifice for our sins and then rose from the dead to sit with God up in the heavens. That gives us the redemptive power of everlasting life with him in the presence of God. If we believe, if we, as my wife calls it, do that U-turn and start to repent, the Lord is just waiting for us with open arms. We're going to hear a, a story this after uh, this morning um, with our brother Jerry here that, that he talks about that. He talks about a life where uh, he, had to, he had to just stop, pull a U-turn, and get right with God. So why don't we sing about that, the victory in Jesus, by standing and, uh, and singing these words out loud because they apply to all of us. One, two, three, M.
Father, Lord, thank you so much for the victory that you provide to each and every one of us, Lord, in little tiny victories and in the most glorious victory that you have given us in power over death and sin, Lord. And we just thank you for that beautiful, beautiful, very expensive gift that you gave us for free, Lord, and we thank you. We pray uh, this this day that um, you bring us to open hearts, open minds, that we may um, let your glory fill us, fill this room, fill each other with the things that we hear and say and speak and feel, Lord, in Jesus' name. Try. 
at your name The mountain shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth We shout your name Shout your name Filling up the skies With endless praise Endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name At your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, angels will bow. Earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. God, we will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. This next song is going to be a song of uh, uh, where you can bring your offerings, your tithes, your gifts up forward either to the baskets here. We have baskets in the back. There's nothing much more that will ever come. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come fly. 
nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're living more. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweet. I'm going to remind us uh, who controls all of that. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens? when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds stick fast together. I love that water skins of the heavens that have been poured out. Uh, and so God is talking to Job uh, and explains to him that he is the sovereign God of the universe, God over creation itself. And so Job responds to God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides knowledge uh, excuse me, that hides counsel without knowledge. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes." So when Job turns to God and says, I heard of you, but now I see you, Job is talking about the eyes of his heart, that now he sees God for who he really is, and he repents, and he is transformed. And so that invitation is for all of us, brothers and sisters, to come before the Lord, 
confess and repent and call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So today we have a story from within where Jerry Fox is going to share just that, where he met the living God, repented and called upon him, and the work that God is doing now in his life he's going to share with us. So let's rejoice and welcome Jerry Fox. I was born in 1966, my mother was 19, and my father was only 17, a senior in high school. My mother found out she was pregnant from a previous relationship. My father did not break up with her. In fact, they got married, and he signed the birth certificate as the baby's father. I did, did, not, did not know this until I was in my late teens, but it did not matter to me. Roxanne was still my sister, and I loved her. We were not a Christian family. I did not even think I knew about God until I was in the fourth grade. My father was a good man, well-liked and known by everyone. He was highly intelligent. He set up a four-year machinist apprenticeship at Westinghouse before he even graduated from high school and finished that apprenticeship in only two years. At 19, he bought the house I grew up in, kinda, and he and my grandfather immediately built a two-story addition that was three times the size of the original house. There was a huge yard that was on a big hill where all the kids in the neighborhood would go sledding in the winter. My mother's family lived two houses away. My father was doing very well for a 20-year-old man. He had a house, two vehicles, as well as a camper. Some of my best early childhood memories were spent, or of time spent camping in the mountains in that thing. I remember the four-door Malibu, Malibu sedan, too. We also had, back then, it did not have seat belts. I sat in the back, and I liked playing with the door handles. One time, I fell out of the car when we were driving down the road. I was not hurt, but my dad immediately took the handles off the doors in the back seat. My mother worked at Dunkin' Donuts, and it took all my strength to stay awake at night, waiting for her to come home from work. I could see the lights come up through the floor, and when she came in the room, I would pretend I had just woken up. Of course, my mom knew I didn't. She would give me my delicious cream donut, which was my favorite, and still is. Other than those things, I don't have many memories of that time of my life. I blocked out a lot due to the events of the years that followed. Although he was doing very well, the devil had plans to derail my father's life. When he left Westinghouse and took a higher paying job at the machine shop in our town, he met a co-worker named Augie who had just happened to be the treasurer of the motorcycle gang called the Pegans. For my dad and all of us, it was downhill from there. My dad started hanging out with the bikers, using drugs and everything else that came along with life, that lifestyle. They would get together at our house with all their bikes and loud music. My only memory of this time was thinking how cool it was. My father even built his own motorcycle, a chopper. He was creative and decorated by broadcasting, broadcasting aluminum shavings from the lathe into the wet black paint, and then he clear-coated it, making a shimmering metallic finish. I remember that it was so low I could touch the ground with both feet when I sat on it. I was only seven years old. Eventually, my father joined the Pagans. Almost immediately, my mother took my sister and I and moved with, in with her parents. Since they lived so close to us, I still saw my dad every day. My mother got involved with another man, and she remarried within a year after divorcing my father. Excuse me. The irony was that she left my father for being in a motorcycle gang, but she married a man who was in a rival club. I did not make sen it did not make sense to me, and I became more confused about my mother's choices. My mother had been working as a bartender, and she became an alcoholic. She worked there and drank there every day for a long time. I had to stay with her at the bar after school to wait for her to get done working. Her, mo her new husband was physically abusive. I cannot count the times I saw him beat my mother. I tried a few times to stop him, but I was, in I was incredibly young, and he would just beat me also. In the fourth grade, I had my introduction to God. I was bounced back and forth between my parents' houses, but it was my step-grandfather, whose name was Ted, who used to pick me and my sister up every Sunday for church when we lived with my mom. That year, I learned about God and Jesus and when, we were, when we were in Sunday school. I learned about prayer, and boy, did I pray. I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for God to have my dad come rescue me. I was afraid to tell my dad what was going on at my mother's house. I was also afraid of my stepfather. I wondered if my father would even believe me. 
I finally got the courage to tell my father, and one night he came to the house with a couple of his buddies and threatened my stepfather that if he ever touched me or my mother again, it would be the last thing he did. I never saw my father act that way, and it scared me. Well, my stepfather never touched me again, but he was very mean to me. Shortly after my father threatened him, I moved back in with my dad. I was now in fifth grade and did well in school. By seventh grade, we were living with my dad's parents and my grandfather Fox was a good man. He raised three of his grandkids, including me. He taught me a strong work ethic and how to earn things I wanted. My grandfather worked a lot. In fact, he had three jobs. He was the definition of a workaholic, most likely because he grew up and lived in the meadows during the depression and never wanted to experience something like that again. When I lived with him, we always had plenty of food, especially eggs. When I was a young teenager, I ate a lot of French toast because that was the only thing I knew how to cook for myself. Even though he did not buy name brand foods, he did an excellent job providing for us, for which I am thankful. First Timothy 5, 8 says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than the unbeliever. My grandfather believed in God, but he was angry with him. While my grandfather worked a lot, it was what kept him going so long after his retirement. I worked with him and learned a lot about home repairs as well as auto mechanics. In fact, we have a lot of great memories from being at his gas station in Westville, New Jersey. I used the automotive skills he taught me to fix up a small motorcycle. I drove it all over town illegally, but I never got caught. It was a Harley 90cc that looked like a moped, and you didn't need tags on mopeds back then. My, mother moved, my father moved back to Philadelphia and became a chapter president of the club. I did not see my father much after that. When I was older, a friend suggested I read a book called Prodigal Father, Peg and Son. He said my father was in the book, and when I read it, it opened my eyes to what his life in the gang was really like. My father had shielded us from many of the terrible things he was doing. What happened next in my life changed my life forever. It was near Christmas. I was in sixth grade. I came home from school extremely excited. My father was going to take me to see my favorite brand at the time, Kiss. As I was holding the tickets and daydreaming about playing guitar on stage with the band, I thought I heard my grandfather crying. His bedroom was directly above mine. I shook it off because I never saw him cry. I went out and turned on the TV and there was a special news announcement. Excuse me. In the news video, I saw the back of my father's pickup truck parked on the side of the highway. The man on the news was reporting a shooting on the PA turnpike. The man was shot and killed. It was not my father who was shot. My father had done the shooting. He was in Montgomery County Jail for a year defending his case. I only saw him once during that time through a piece of glass and talked to him on a phone. The ruling was in favor of a temporary insanity plea as he was high on drugs at the time of the shooting. He was committed to the state mental health institution and was there for 20 years. Excuse me again. I saw him once in that first institution while he was there as my grandfather refused to go there again. It was very scary. The same year, that same year I scored extremely high on a national aptitude test and was put in advanced classes the following year. I was expected to do a lot of the assignments unsupervised. Instead, I started to hang out with the older kids down the street from my house. I was 12, they were between 16 and 19 years old. I started drinking and doing drugs with them so much that by ninth grade, I was supplying them with most of the drugs we took. I got them from my father's friends in the motorcycle gang. They were like my family. I thought they were looking out for me, but I was being groomed to be a part of the next generation of biker gang members. I was more interested in this life of partying than school. I was constantly at the police station for one thing or another. I did not think I had done anything that serious at the time but I just did whatever I wanted because I was not being supervised by anyone. Grandpa worked so much that whenever he was home, he was sleeping. My friends and I were considered troublemakers and we all had rebellious long hair. Yeah, I had long hair. I also failed seventh grade. I did many things that eventually got me into juvenile detention. The first time I was in for 10 days, we were chased and caught by the police on our dirt bikes over the summer so many times. By summer's end, I had a shoebox full of police citations that amounted to over $3,000. By ninth grade, I was arrested again while cutting school. 
I naively went with my friend into his neighbor's house to hang out when they were not at home. As we were relaxing, watching TV and eating their food, the police arrived and arrested us for breaking and entering. I was not even thinking I had committed a crime. I was in juvenile detention for another 10 days. In Woodshop, I made nunchucks and nightsticks. I was so proud of my work, I stamped my name on the bottom of them and gave them out to my friends. We were involved in fights using these weapons and ended up back in detention for a third and fourth time. I was finally sent to a boys' reform school in Pittsburgh, Georgetown Republic. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I had supervision, guidance there, something I never had. I worked out, I played football, I finally excelled in school. I went to full-time school there over the summer and received enough credit to skip 10th grade and advance to my junior year where I was supposed to be. My grandfather cried and was so happy for me that he paid off all my outstanding citations. When I came home, I joined the wrestling team, did well in school, and even Principal Williams came to practice one day and shared with me that he was proud of the changes he saw in me. During this time, my father was transferred to another institution that was closer to where we lived. So my dad's best friend took me to see him. This man was the president of the Delaware County chapter of the Pagans. And I was with him a lot after I came back from Pittsburgh. He was not a good influence in my life. I was never home, I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. I thought about God, but did not think he cared about me. I did not follow God, instead I blamed him for everything that went wrong in my life. Proverbs 19.3, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. That was me. I blamed God for everything that happened to me. I felt like the world owed me as if the world took, and God took my father from me, even though it was his, the consequences of my father's sinful choices. The good news is that my father accepted Jesus as his savior, so he was walking with the Lord for 17 of the 20 years he was institutionalized. He spoke to me a prayer in Jesus quite often and warned me about the life I was leading that I was going to end up like him. I chose to ignore him in most of his advice. I was living life for myself, enjoying the gifts my father gave me to make up for not being there, like a Harley Sports to drive to school my senior year. I quickly moved into the nightclub bar scene after school. Everyone knew me. I was out of control doing whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I sold drugs and practically lived in those nightclubs. I thought it was fun and would last forever. It didn't. Make no, no mistake, during this time, I did think about how I was living quite often. My conscience was convicting me. God was speaking to me. I rationalized my behavior by telling myself it was okay because I wasn't hurting anybody else, right? I'm still a good person. I go out of my way to help anybody I can. I do charitable deeds. I share my money. So my behavior is okay, right? No, it wasn't. This life led me right to county jail. I was arrested five times for possession and sale of drugs. My father bailed me out and got me lawyers four times. The fifth time he had enough. He said that I, need, that I needed tough love, and I did. But my father took pity on me one last time. When I was released, he bought me a trailer in South Jersey near my grand, where my grandfather lived at the time to keep me away from Delco, and I moved in there. When I was 20, my dad was granted weekend passes, and I picked him up every weekend so we spent a lot of time together. He bought a new motorcycle for he and I to use. He even rode it to church on Sundays. He was always trying to get me to go to church. I did a few times just to make him happy. God had been calling me for my entire life, but I chose to ignore him. I worked 80 hours a week pumping gas to keep myself out of bars. It also kept me away from my life of sin back in Delaware County. I saved a lot of money and bought my first car, a 77 Hearst Limited Edition Trans Am. I was able to drive to work then. I got a job working for more money at a boat building company in Millville, Silverton Marine. But I had more free time and began going back to my old stomping grounds frequently. My life continued to follow the destructive path for some time. God never gave up on me. As I was given the opportunity to move to Orlando, Florida with a new, with a new job at another boat builder, Regal Boats. I was promoted quickly and I liked the work. I did not like the Florida weather though. I met a man named Greg at work. It turned out that, that he and the owner of the company were both Christians. Greg was getting hassled by the other employees because he was the manager hired for his business skills, but he knew nothing about building boats. I chose to befriend him and show him everything I knew. We started going canoeing and fishing together. The second time, he asked me if I knew Jesus. He shared what God had done in his life, and we talked for hours about it. Greg convinced me that 
the simple choices I made caused my life to be in ruins. It was not God that did this to me. And I asked God to come into my heart. I thought I could go to church on Sundays, pray, read the Bible, and still hang out in nightclubs. We cannot have what we think is the best of both worlds. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. At Christmas in 1992, we were given an extra week's paid vacation. I came home to Pennsylvania and never returned to Florida. I was arrested the third night I came home for possession of drugs in the car. I spent four months in, in the county jail. I contacted my friend Greg in Florida. He was very sympathetic. He sent me a study Bible. I read it every day. I even started a Bible study with four other inmates. After I was released, I moved back in with my mother and went right back to living for myself. Then one night, God used the circumstance, my circumstances to wake me up again. I was intoxicated when I left the nightclub. I went home to get some drugs to bring to a female friend. I was traveling on my motorcycle when another drunk driver made a U-turn into oncoming traffic. I ran directly into the left fender of his car. Police said I was doing 70 miles an hour and was thrown over 70 feet into the air. My helmet flew off, so my head slammed directly into the pavement. The doctors told me my head hit the concrete so hard that my brain moved through the fluid surrounding, surrounding it and smacked my skull. It's really bru bruising it. They were baffled as to why my skull had not crushed or been fractured. That kind of impact should have killed me. It was because God still had a plan for me. Psalm 138, 6 to 7 says, Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes, and with your right hand you save me. And boy, did he save me. God saved me from myself that night, and several more times as well. I was my own worst enemy. After two weeks in ICU and five more weeks relearning how to read and do simple math again, the doctors recommended that I stay another six weeks in bed. Against medical advice, I checked out of the hospital. I did not use the wheelchair. I walked around in a cast that was not made for walking. I went right back to my lifestyle. I chose to ignore God once again. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I should have died that night. Yet I chose to ignore the God who spared my life. But once again, he did not give up on me. In fact, he sent me a sweet little angel that, I, that he knew I could not ignore. My daughter, Alexis Marie. God used her to bring me back to himself and, and start to walk the way I should have. When Alexis was born, I made a conscious decision to bring her up the opposite way I was brought up. But you don't change 35 years of programming overnight, right? We started attending Assemblies of God church in West Cape May, and, the, and Pastor West was awesome, but he left, and the new pastor just wasn't doing it for me. I used that as an excuse to leave the church. There I go again with the me, me, me. I buried myself in my construction company, so all I did was work. I did stop using drugs before Alexis was born. Yes, I just stopped. Some people can do that. God took away my desire, and I am so thankful for that. The Lord called me repeatedly. He put me in a place where I could not ignore him. When we moved to a new house, I saw a Rio Grande Bible Baptist Church every time I stepped out my front door. We were that close. My little girl saw the people in the church going every Sunday and asked me that every time, Dad, when can we go to church again? I told her, maybe next week, honey. One, one day I was outside doing yard work, and Lexus asked me the same thing she always did. I told her the same thing I always did. She turned and stomped into the house and came out five minutes later wearing one of her beautiful dresses. And she grabbed my hand and said, Daddy, we're going to church. So I went with her wearing my dirty yard work clothes. We became members of the church. It was like a large family. Pastor Jeff opened my eyes to a lot of things I never realized before. Alexis spent first and second grade attending school there. When Alexis was in third grade, we enrolled her in Cape Christian Academy. The director, John Spriggs, and School Board President Jack Lessingring almost immediately asked me to join the building committee for the new gym project. I ended up building the locker rooms and bathrooms and coordinating the installation of the basketball court floor. When I showed up at work to work at school at that school, Alexis's eyes would light up when she saw me there. I love that little girl with all my heart. I was going to make sure she had everything I never did, and I have. 
Yeah, that was me in the cougar costume. That thing was hot. I became good friends with John Spriggs and his family. We were very involved with everything the school did, including several unforgetful trips to creation where I volunteered at every year. I read the Bible with Alexis daily, and she used to love reading it to me. God used Alexis Marie to bring me to where I needed to be, walking with him. Unfortunately, my son chose a different path. He is now a grown man and has been made some bad decisions, which he is paying for now. He claims to have found God, which I am very thankful for. I will always be there for him. He does not call me much, but when he does, I am grateful. He will be home this October. I can't wait. I was walking with the Lord, even though I was still drinking. I rationalized it by telling myself that even though I was drinking, I was not going to bars or doing drugs, so it was okay. No, it wasn't. 1 Corinthians 6, 10, and 11 says, Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of the God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, this is true if you repent. Luke 13, 3 says, But unless you repent, you too will all perish. One Wednesday night, I took Alexis to the Lighthouse Church for the youth group and heard a voice. Excuse me one more time. <laughs> Sorry. It's just something that happens when I speak publicly. I don't know what it is. I heard a voice coming from the cafeteria. Something drew me in to listen. It was Pastor Charlie instructing a group. I attended once, and I was hooked. I started regularly attending church here also. I felt like every sermon Pastor Rudy gave was just for me, like God was speaking directly to me. In fact, he was. I became involved in men's study and bridge also. On Christmas Eve 2019, I made the mistake of drinking and driving, and that landed me in jail. I would have lost everything I owned if it weren't for the kindness of a member of this church who I only met twice, Phil Resco. He took the time to get all my belongings and stored them on his property the entire time I was away and for some quite time after I came home. He would not accept anything for his kindness. He told me just to pay it forward, which I have. He is a wonderful example of how we should treat people in need. My time in jail was far from wasted. Pastor Gary regularly took phone calls from me. He had Pastor Charlie bring me a chronological version of the Bible to read. He also sent me the Strong's Concordance and a Bible dictionary so I could look things up. I dug in and spent many, many hours reading and studying. I got through the entire Bible two times while I was there, 14 months because of COVID. I read it and understood it. God gave me peace, and I also came to understand that my sin was what got me into jail. God allowed me to use my time to learn about who he was. Now I read the Bible daily, recalling the scriptures I have read, been studying. I will continue to read the Bible as many times as I can. I learn more about myself in a court-mandated drug program than I thought I would. For one, I learned my alcohol abuse contributed to these, the mother of my children and I no longer being together. But I have lost all bitterness towards her. We are now friends. I help her and her mother as much as I can. That makes my, girl, my little my daughter happy. I no longer worry at all. I know God has me. Matthew 6, 25 to 27 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Besides, worrying does not change the end result in any way. It's not been easy, but with God's help, my walk is true and sincere. I have failed many tests, turning back to old sinful ways of vindictive behavior when people do me wrong. But now I don't get mad with people anymore. I pray for them. I am truly ready to serve the Lord and do what he wants me to do. If anyone here thinks they have committed too many sins or are not worthy of forgiveness in Jesus, you are wrong. You have heard my story, and I've only skimmed the surface of what I've been through and have done. He has forgiven me. He will forgive you. All you must do is ask, repent and ask. It's never too late. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can remain standing. We're going to sing one more song of worship.
you all get up here. We're going to sing about God's power as exhibited there with Jerry's story. Thank you, Jerry. can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face Every fear of the unknown I can hear All God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome Same power that rose Jesus from the grave The same power that commands the dead to wake Lives in us lives in us the same power that moves mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a rage and see lives in us lives in us he lives in us he lives in us we have hope that his promises are true in his strength there is nothing we can't do yes we know there are greater things in store we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose jesus from the grave same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. That is living in me. He's conquered our enemy. The power of darkness, no weapon prevails. We stand here in victory. Oh, greater is He that is living in me. He's conquered. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, thank you for the work that you've done in all of us and 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 in Jerry, uh, Jerry, uh, how he's turned to you can be a lesson to all of us that it's never too late. It's never too late to do a U-turn to repent and say, 
Lord, take me. We thank you for that love. We thank you for that grace. We thank you for the promises of having an everlasting life in your presence. You are the God of creation. You are all. Thank you for, uh, for everything you've done for us. Thank you for your son who's come to this earth. He lived a sinless life, died on the cross to forgive our sins, to take all our sins on so that we can be forgiven. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, there's still a prayer available here. If not standing where you are right now with the person next to you, uh, there's also in the corner here our prayer teams here waiting to pray with you, pray for you, pray over you, pray for somebody. Please take advantage of that. The same power that rose Jesus from